All right, um, let's look at some announcements. First of all, your homework assignment for chapter six, the first momentum assignment is due in class on Tuesday. And I also wanted to point out there's a lot of old assignment papers that haven't been collected. Those are in a box outside my office door if you'd like to collect those. And uh, also, uh, you know there's a grade book online on iLearn where your grades are posted. I'd encourage you to look at that with the computer and not with your mobile phone because for some reason, the way the gradebook appears in the mobile phone is really mixed up and crazy. It displays a lot of uh, information that's irrelevant, and then it's missing the stuff that is important. So, um, in other words, the, the gradebook as it's appearing on the mobile phone is nonsensical. So just look at it on the desktop, and you'll see the category averages and your uh, weighted average percentage, and uh, let me know if you've got any questions about that. Okay, so uh, one last thing I wanted to point out is you can find out on iLearn, here's the course schedule for the semester, and it's showing everything that we've done, everything we will be doing. And so let's look at where we're at. Here we are today, class 23, and you'll notice that the midterm exam is on class 25, and so that's a week from today, on Sunday, May 1st. And the coverage for that is chapter 4, 5, and 6. So if you look at from when we had our last midterm exam, we've cap, uh, covered chapter four, which was all of these topics, the big ideas are Euler's equation, Bernoulli's rotational flow, fluid acceleration. In chapter five, we had continuity, you know, the Reynolds transport theorem, and now in chapter six, we're doing momentum. All right. So then after we have our midterm exam a week from today, there's just chapter seven and part of chapter eight until we're finished with the semester. Just to give you some perspective on where things are. All right, so we're continuing with momentum applications. Uh, any schedule-related questions before we move on? Yes? For the quiz? Um, you know, I'd really rather not because we got a lot that we need to cover on the momentum, but here's what I'll do. I'm going to correct the uh, key. You know, I have a mistake with the density and I'll post that online. So you can take a look at the key after class, and if you have questions about that, then stop by my office. All right. So here are the three broad categories of momentum applications that we solve for in Chapter 6. Uh, there is fluid jets, where we're going to be finding the force that arises out of a jet entering some sort of a body like a container. There are nozzles, where the flow is going to be changing velocity and as a result, since velocity is one of the factors that accounts for fluid momentum, then we have to apply an external force to hold the system steady. And then there are veins where the fluid flow is redirected by a plate of some sort. We're going to look today at jets and veins. Let's start with the first of these, with the fluid jet. All right, so in this case, there is a tank, and uh, it's a tank of water, and the fluid jet coming in has the diameter of it defined. And so that's implying that this is a circular fluid jet that's coming in. It's moving at a velocity of 15 meters per second and it's filling the tank. Now, the tank characteristics are that it has some mass, the tank itself, it's presumably made out of metal or something. And so the tank itself has a mass of five kilograms. And uh, at this moment in time that it's showing the picture, then there's 20 liters of water. And so what we need to do uh, is find the force that the stop block applies to the tank and then the force acting on the bottom of the tank. And so if I was to draw this example on the board, here's the water and the fluid jets coming in. We first of all think about where is our control surface. And so the control surface is along the outside of the control volume and I draw that dashed line just to represent its imaginary control surface and then here where the jet is crossing through the control surface is where we have the, uh, the diameter of the jet is known as 30 millimeters. Now, to hold the system steady, we can already have a sense for what forces have to be applied to the tank. So think about in the x direction. Are we going to push this tank to the left or would we have to push the tank to the right to resist what is happening with this fluid jet? To the right. Clearly, because uh, if you just think about what if this was on a really slippery surface and we're spraying it with a jet, maybe from a hose. 
if it was on a slippery, slippery surface and there's no friction to hold it in place, then obviously because there's a component of the jet is in the X direction, a small fraction of it, if you look at the angle, it's saying 70 degrees. That means most of the momentum is up and down. Most of the momentum is actually pushing the tank onto, the, onto whatever surface that's holding it up more. But a fraction of that momentum is to the left. And so to hold the system steady, we have to push to the right. And one of the things I need to remind you about is that when we write the momentum equation, the sum of the forces, for instance, in the x direction, is the sum of the mass flow through the tr control surface out, velocity out in x, minus the sum through the control surfaces, the mass flow rate in, velocity in in x. So on the left-hand side, the English interpretation of what's on the left-hand side is the force required to hold the system steady. And so that's what this force is going to do, an external force that holds the system steady in view of the momentum effects that are occurring to the system. So this jet's coming in. All right, so here, the force that the stop block applies to the tank, that's the X force. That's the force in the X direction. It'll be to the right. And what about the vertical force, the force acting on the bottom of the tank? We're going to have to push up on the bottom of the tank to hold the system steady for three reasons. The first is the incoming fluid jet. The second is because of the mass of the tank. And the third is because the mass of the water that's already there. All right, so here's the formula. I've written it on the board. The, uh, the uh, momentum equation for forces in the x direction. What I'd like you to do is take a moment and calculate the mass flow rate, the component of the velocity that's in the x direction, and so, since it's 70 degrees, uh, only a small fraction of, the, of that velocity is in the x direction. And see if you can find the, uh, the force that we have to apply in the x direction to hold the system steady. Of course, we can see that there's only mass flow in and there's no mass flow out. All right, so go ahead and get started on this one. All right, so just for the x direction, what we need to do, first of all, is uh, some preliminary calculations. You'll notice that uh, before I started with the momentum, I found the area of the jet, the weight of the tank, the weight of the water inside of the tank. Just because I know I'm going to use those later, I finish it up early. So here's the x direction. The first thing we need to know is there's no flow out. There's only a jet coming in. And so the out term is going to cancel out entirely. And what's left, we need to know the mass flow in and then the component of the velocity in the x direction. So for the mass flow rate, I know that that's the density times the cross-sectional area of the jet multiplied by the velocity of the jet. Now, in this first part, for the mass flow rate, I don't take the uh, angle into account. It's just asking what is the overall mass flow rate. It's not asking for me to find like some component of the mass flow rate in the x direction because I do that later here with the velocity in the x direction. So I don't need to account for the angle twice. I only need to correct for the angle one time. So that's why here I've got the density, the cross-sectional area, and then the velocity. So the mass flow rate's a scalar. Mass flow rates will only have positive values, 10.6 kilograms per second and then I substitute that, you'll notice that the negative sign here is because we have flows in but no flow out. And so that's where this minus sign comes from in the, uh, the force in the x direction, the velocity times the cosine of the angle. So the velocity is negative 15 meters per second because in the x direction it's to the left, that incoming jet is in the negative x direction and then the cosine of 70 is 0.342. So we should apply 54.4 newtons to the right to that tank in order to resist the force that arises because of the fluid momentum. All right, so are there questions for the x direction? Things will be the similar way for the y direction. So for the y direction, there's no flow out. 
So that first term just cancels out entirely, the flow rate out uh, term. So there's the negative sign, mass flow rate in, velocity, and then the sine of 70 rather than the cosine of 70. Uh, so you'll notice here's the negative sign. The mass flow rate stays the same from the, from the first part. It's still 10.6 kilograms per second, still the mass flow rate in. But now most of the velocity is in the y direction, the negative y direction. Um, so the force ends up being positive because here is a negative sign because it's a flow uh, in. And then here's the negative sign because it's down. So what that means is it's a force that should be applied upward to the tank in order to resist the momentum of the jet. So then the total force is going to include the momentum force and then the weight of the tank and the weight of the water that's currently in the tank. So to support that tank in total we have to apply a force of 394.6 upward to hold it steady. All right. Are there any questions from this example? Let's look at veins. And uh, in this case we have a vein that is deflecting a jet of water in two different directions. The incoming jet of water, we know the mass flow rate here, that's given directly, and we know the velocity of the jet, and it looks for whatever reason, it might be turbulence inside of this uh, location where the flow velocity is, is changing its direction, that the magnitude of the velocity is also changing. This first stream that comes out, V2, has a velocity of 10.8 meters per second, and then V3, which is going down and to the left, has a velocity of 9.9 .9 meters per second. So what we want to know is what forces does the water jet apply to, de to the deflection plate? Now we have to be careful with this because remember the way that this equation is written is the force required to hold the system steady. But this is asking for the sort of the reverse of that. This is asking not what force is required to hold the system steady, but this is asking what force does the jet apply to the deflection plate. And so keep in the back of your mind you're going to have to take the opposite of what you calculate from the momentum equations, because the momentum equation will tell you not how much the jet applies to the deflection plate, but how much the deflection plate would have to be steadied in reaction to the jet. All right. So let's follow the same procedure. First, find the uh, forces in the x direction required to hold the system steady, and then flip it to find the force of the jet on the plate, and then so on with uh, the y direction. So the flow in equals the flow out here. There's no place the water is going to be stored inside of the control volume. So we have the mass flow rate in is 6.7. And we can calculate the mass flow rate at 3 because we have the diameter of the jet and the velocity. So that gives you the mass. Uh, you can calculate the mass flow rate at, at location 3. And then from location 2, it's just subtracting the in and the other outstream to find the mass flow rate at 2. So we're applying the continuity principle there. Um, so then in the x direction, we have both a flow out and a flow in. So we're going to have to keep track of both streams. First of all, the flow out is going to be, uh, in the x direction, we've got stream 2 and stream 3 are flowing out. And uh, you can see that stream 2 has a velocity of 10.8, and that's to the right. So we don't have to put a negative sign in front of that velocity. We are accounting for the component of the velocity that's in the x direction with the cosine of 70. And then 
the flow, this 9.9 .9 meters per second, the negative sign there is because it's to the left. And again, we're com uh, considering just the x direction component of that velocity. And then subtracting the mass flow rate in, multiplied by the velocity in. So there's a lot going on inside of that expression. And so that's why I've taken it in several steps here. Uh, you know, combining, combining the uh, mass flow rate in the velocity to find a force, showing what is the uh, cosine of 70 degrees and so on. Um, so if we consider all of that, I hope it makes sense that we should, to hold the system steady, you have to push to the left. And that, maybe I should have asked that question at the beginning before we started the calculations, like conceptually, what do you think is the force that we would have to push on this plate to hold it steady. Well, obviously, because the jet's coming in from the right and then it's splitting off in those directions, I think you sort of already have sort of a visceral sense that you'd have to push to the left to hold it steady. And so it's asking, what force does the jet apply to the plate? And so the jet is pushing on the plate to the right. And that's why here on the solution, I have flipped the calculation. I've said, you know, the sum of the forces required to hold this system steady is negative 74. And so the force required, the force of the jet on the plate is 74 to the right. Any questions from the x direction part of this example? Okay, it's the same kind of procedure for the y direction. Except for it's a little simpler, I guess, because if we look at the incoming jet, it, yeah, there's no flow in in the y direction. So I guess if we, if we talk about just uh, our expectations before calculating, just the quantitative expectations, the forces we have to apply to hold this plate steady, it's mostly going to be pushing to the left, and there's not going to be too much vertical force because of just looking at the direction that we're changing the flow. And so the relative magnitude should be lower. And that is what we find. In fact, it's only about one-tenth of the force once we do the calculations. So, um, you know, we were in a bit of a rush today because of the time of the quiz, so we didn't have time to uh, draw out these examples quite like I would have preferred. But if you need extra time to look at the numbers, of course, the recording will be posted on iLearn. I'm going to grade those quizzes as quick as I can and put the grades on iLearn so that you have a sense of where your score is. And remember, I'll also post an updated version of the key, and I'll send you an email when that's online for you to take a look at. So uh, let's take a look at these uh, announcements before we finish. Homework 6A is due next time in class, and then a week from today, we have our exam, right? Sunday, May 1st. So. A lot going on. All right, I'll see you on Tuesday.